Just a little recap of where we've been and where we're headed. Um, we spent the majority of our first study talking about the introduction to the book, most of which we learned from verse one. Uh, and then we moved into the next 17 verses, which uh, deal with trials and temptations and the benefits of enduring those. And so we've talked about in verses two through four, uh, the purpose and the benefit of trials. Uh, last week, we talked about how to obtain wisdom to face our trials. We, uh, if we lack wisdom, we ask God. Uh, and we do so, he tells us, without doubting. And so this morning, we're going to look at verses 9 through 11, or begin there, talking about the proper view of trials when it comes to uh, wealth and poverty, and then hopefully move in uh, to the next, the last portion of this section, verses 12 through 18, where we talk about the source of temptation and the source of blessing. So the proper view of trials and poverty. He says in verse 9, But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. So we see here the statement, the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. Depending on your translation, you may see the word low degree or lowly. Uh, New American Standard uses humble circumstances. It's obvious here he's talking about material uh, matters uh, to a great extent. In chapter 2 and verse 5, we see, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he promised to those who love him. We know he's talking material things here because we back up to verse 2 and he's talking about a man with a gold ring and fine clothes versus a poor man in dirty clothes coming into the assembly. And so he makes the statement that God chose the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. And so here in verse 9 of chapter 1, he says the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. So I think... Verse 5 of chapter 2 tells us what that high position is. You know, as far as the world looks at, at uh, material things, a poor person doesn't rank very highly. Uh, but according to what he says here in verse 5 of chapter 2, he says we have a very high position. He says that position is that we're rich in faith and we're heirs of the kingdom, those who are poor, who are brothers. This is an admonishment. James is making an admonishment here for us to focus on the eternal, not the temporal. The world places all the emphasis upon the temporal, the things that are seen. But we as Christians may fall into that rut sometimes, but what he's reminding us here is that we have to look at the things that are not seen. We have to look at the eternal. And that's how we weigh things. And that's how we determine our worth. Uh, the world, you know, if we, if we don't have a certain, you know, status, standard of living, the world may not treat us very nicely. The world may regard us as not very important, but God says that's not the case with him. The poor in this world were chosen, he says, to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom. So we have a very high position regardless of our material status here in this life. So we can't allow these things to drag us down. It's difficult. You know, we look all around us. We see others prospering. That was what Asaph said in Psalm 73. He looked around and he saw the, or the, the wicked, how they were fat, how they had no problems, how they had no troubles, how everything they seemed to do just worked out. And he wasn't seeing that in his own life, and he despaired. But then it said he went to the, to the, the house of God, to the sanctuary of the Lord, and there he saw the end of the wicked. He saw how what would become of them versus what would become of him if he remained faithful to the Lord. So we read uh, this in, in 2 Corinthians. Paul alludes to this very thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I remind myself of this quite often because it's so easy for us to, to focus on the things we see. But he says in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 
And so that's how the brother of humble circumstances can glory in his high position because he's not looking at the way he's dressed. He's not looking at the number of cars he has in the driveway or the number of bedrooms his home has or how big his retirement account is. He's looking at the eternal, the things which are not seen. And I like here, and we'll probably talk about this more later, but for Paul to make such a statement, you know, it's true that our afflictions are momentary, even if they last from the time we're born to the time we die, they're, they're, they're momentary, at least in the, in the, the scale of infinity or, or eternal uh, life, they're, they're momentary. But he says, he calls them light, if it, of, excuse me, light afflictions. But yet we turn over just a few chapters to chapter 11 and we read about Paul's afflictions and we would call those things anything but light. But by comparison, that's the point he's making here, light afflictions are producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. No matter what we suffer, no matter what Paul suffered, all those things that he lists there in chapter 11, the, the abuse that he received, the beatings, the stonings, the shipwrecks, being in peril, worry, all those things that we read about there, he says that they don't even compare to the weight of glory, the eternal weight of glory. I've never held an Olympic medal, a gold medal, but I've heard they're quite heavy because gold is one of the most densest materials we have. It's denser than lead. And so it's very heavy. And so that's kind of the illusion that he makes here, a weight, not of gold, but of glory for us an eternal weight of glory. And so no matter what we go through in this life, Paul's saying it's worth it. But what he's telling us is, is we have to look at not the here and now, but the, the future. And that's the same thing I believe jo, uh, James is getting at here in verse 9. The, uh, the, the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. He goes on, he says, the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. And we might ask, what's humiliating about being rich? That's what everybody aspires for in this life, to be rich. What could possibly be humiliating? Well, he tells us there in the verse, he says, like flower and grass, he'll pass away. And the next verse, he says, in the midst of his pursuits, he will fade away. You know, Solomon in Ecclesiastes deals with this topic. And from a worldly standpoint, it is rather humiliating. It's rather frustrating. And, and, and Solomon touches on that in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, if I can find it. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 15, he says, he's talking here about riches. Verse 13 let us know, you know, gives us the context. But verse 15 says, as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he, can, as he came. He'll take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who tolls for the wind? That's a great question. And if our pursuit in this life is the things of this life, what advantage is it to us? Don't take a, don't take a drop of it with us. As we're born, we're the same way we die. In... Luke chapter 12, you remember there the man comes to Jesus and he says, Brother, or tell, uh, Lord, tell, the, this, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And Jesus says, you know, nobody appointed me your arbitrator. But he tells him that, you know, even when our lives consist of, of, great, of great things, of abundance, that, you know, that's not what our lives consist of. That's really not what it's about. And he tells a parable of a rich man who's, he says, his fields are very productive. And we know the story, how the man goes down through the list and he's got all these problems, don't he? He's got all this grain and all these goods, but he don't have a place to put them. So what am I going to do? I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger barns. The whole time he never gives credit to God. The whole time he never thinks about anybody but himself. And there we read in verse 20, God said, you fool, this very night your life will be required of you. And then who will inherit what you have gathered, what you have laid up, what you have, what you have uh, succeeded with accomplishing in this life. And then Matthew 16, verse 26, Jesus asked the question, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his, own, for his soul? Well, 
The answer is not much, but there's a lot of people out there who are doing that very thing. And if we're not careful, we'll be swept up in it too because it's all around us. We see it on social media. You know, we've got all these influencers on there who are living this, what seems like a grand life, a grand life. They've got all these fancy clothes. They go to all these fancy places. They drive fancy cars. And it just seems like, you know, they're so beautiful and their life is just so wonderful. And it can make us want to pursue that same path. And a lot of young people get swept up in that. Maybe now more than ever, but it's been a problem, at least in this nation, probably from very early on at least in the, the 19th century, or the, the 20th century, I mean. Again, what is this? Well, this is an admonishment. James is admonishing us to focus not on the, the temporal, but on the eternal. To understand the deceitfulness of riches, or the deceitfulness of wealth. You remember there in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower, the seed that fell among the thorn. The thorns come up and choked it out, and Jesus said these are the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of life, the worries of life. In Philippians 4, turn there quickly if you will, because Paul really puts into perspective here the way, the attitude that we as Christians should have concerning these things. In Philippians 4, beginning uh, in verse 12, He says, I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. What's Paul talking about here? He's talking about contentment. In whatever state I'm in, to be content. If I have wealth, let me be thankful for it. Let me be content with what I have. Let me give God the credit and God the thanks for it. If I'm, if I'm in need, let me be content with it, knowing that God will provide for me. And that's the context of verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then in verse 14, he applauds them for their care and their sharing with him. There we get the idea of the need that we have to share when we have something to share. That's the attitude that we should have. We need to always remember that wealth and poverty present their own unique trials, present their own unique temptations. Proverbs chapter 30 talks about this very thing. And that's why he asked there not to be wealthy and not to be poor. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 30, beginning with verse uh, 8. He says, keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. And most people would say, well, you know, why not? Everybody wants riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. That I be not full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? That's the danger of wealth. Just like the man there in, in Matthew, uh, or excuse me, Luke chapter 12, forgot all about God. He prospered and he forgot all about God. So, give me not wealth so that I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. When we don't have what we need, we may be tempted to do some things to get it that, that aren't right. And we may profane the name of God. We may say, God, why are you doing this to me? And turn our back on God. Either way, we can turn our back upon God. And so there's dangers, and we need to remember that. And we need to remember, as 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 tells us, that godliness with contentment is a means of great gain. That's the great gain that we need to be encouraging our children to pursue. That's the great gain that we ourselves need to be pursuing. Not wealth, not riches, not a fat bank account, not a fat retirement account. We need to be trying to obtain godliness with contentment. Paul says that is a means of great gain. Any questions or comments on these verses before we move on? So let's do our homework here real quick. 
in the workbook and on pages 88 and 89, there's some questions there. And I think if we go over those quickly, it'll be a good study or a good reminder of the things that we have studied. He says, answer the questions given scriptural reference. And I would always encourage you to give scriptural reference anytime that you answer a Bible question. Uh, it's okay to say, I believe and I think and I feel. It's hard not to say those things, but we need to back those things up. Our feelings, our thoughts with Bible scripture. So to whom is this letter addressed? Don't be bashful. Not everybody at once. Christians. It's written to Christians, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. We talked about that, and we talked about how we are spiritual Israel, Paul says in Galatians. How does the writer of this letter describe himself? A bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How should Christians respond to trial? I changed the words there a little bit. I'll explain why I did that. I think he uses the word temptation, which is the word that's in the King James. I've got a chart in a few slides that we'll talk about that. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Consider it all joy. It's what we're told to do. How can various trials work for our good? Produces patience or endurance, knowing the testing of your faith. That's what trials do. They test our faith, and they produce endurance or steadfastness. King James says patience. What did James say one should ask for of the Lord? Wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. There in verse 5. Who did he say would not receive anything from the Lord? The one who doubts, and he calls him a double-minded man. The one who wavereth, or the one who doubts, is like what? Like the waves, the surf of the sea, he's driven and tossed by the wind. We talked about how water of itself can, cannot propel itself. It's just there. It fills whatever volume or void is there. But the wind can drive it. And he says when we're double-minded, when we doubt, that we're like that. We're like water, just without control. We're just being pushed wherever uh, our doubts take us. What kind of person is unstable in all these ways? Double-minded man. Verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We talked about that, how, you know, how horrible it would be if we had two brains that were in constant opposition to one another. Which one do we follow? <laughs> And when we doubt, that's in essence what we have. We, a part of us is saying God can, and the other part of us is saying God can't. Which one do we listen to? Why should the brother of low degree and the rich brother rejoice? Verse 9, the brother of humble circumstances to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. The rich in this life, who are rich in this life only, they have nothing to look forward to. To what does the rich man compare? Like flower and grass. Real pretty. My children love to go out and pick uh, wildflowers. A lot of times just weeds, but you know, when you stop and you take the time to look, they're so beautiful, they're so pretty. And that's the way James describes being rich. It's so pretty. But what happens? Verse 11 says it withers. And the flower falls off. It's not lasting. Riches are not lasting. True or false? Trials are always bad for us. False. Verse 2 tells us that that's not the case. We're to consider it a joy when we encounter them. Verse 3 tells us that it tests our faith and it produces endurance. Trials may help us to become perfect and entire. True. Verse 4. That's, the, that's what the result of endurance is, that we may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Prayer is important in time of trial. That's true. Prayer is important in, at all times as Christians. I don't think we looked at this verse. We looked at verse 5, obviously, but in Colossians chapter 4, he says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehensions, will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Prayer is so important, especially in time of trial. God will respond regardless of our attitude in prayer. That's false. We've got to ask in faith without doubting. Because when we doubt, we ought not to expect anything from the Lord. We talked about how insulting that would be to ask, to make a request of someone, but then doubt their ability to do it. The rich man and the poor man are seen on the same level in Christ. True. Chapter 2, we'll get into this in more detail, but he talks there about the sin of partiality. How that we would treat a rich man better than a poor man when he comes into the assembly. And he tells us, and that's where he says in verse 5, that God chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith. So research, find the verse which describes a similar chain effect of trial as does James 1 verses 2 through 3. It says, we glory in tribulation. Where is that passage? Romans 5? I got Romans 5, so reads a little bit different in the New American Standard, but it says, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Very similar to what James tells us here in verses 2 through 4. Here he says we exult. Same idea, we joy in our trials or our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. It's the same as endurance. That's the same as steadfastness. And steadfastness or endurance or perseverance, it brings about proven character. We're going to talk in a few verses about being approved by trial. Once we have been approved, we'll receive the crown of life. So proven character. You know, a lot of times we think we know what we're made of, but we don't really know what we're made of until we face trial and tribulation. Peter thought he knew what he was made of. Lord, I will never deny you. Lord, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And yet he did the very thing he said he wouldn't do. Trials bring about proven character. And then it says proven character, hope. Hope, you know, we use that word a lot in a very uncertain sense. Yesterday when I was watching the Alabama game, I didn't have much hope in the first half. It was, it was out the window that Alabama was going to be able to win the game. But that's not the hope we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is anticipation, expectation. That's different than just hoping about something uncertain and losing our hope. No, we have an expectation, a confident expectation. Right. Exactly. So hope does not disappoint because the love of God. And that's what we got to remember. You know, sometimes we want to we want to question. Sometimes we want to wonder why is God allowing these things to happen to me? And we forget that God loves us. He poured out his love with us through the Holy Spirit, poured out his love within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Thought question, can trials work equally for our good as well as for our bad, depending upon our attitude or response? Explain. Yeah, they, they can. We're told to count or consider. We talked that that Greek word meant to lead or command our thoughts. Hegeomaya. To count or consider it a joy. To see the joy, to see the benefit of the trial, verse 2. And if we don't, we won't endure. We won't persevere. We'll give up. We talked about Peter and we talked about Judas. Both of them went through a very similar trial, but two totally different outcomes. Peter failed. Peter denied the Lord three times. Judas failed. Judas betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Peter used it. Peter considered it a joy. Peter gained benefit from it. And we see the things that Peter went on to do in the book of Acts. Judas did. Judas went out and he hung himself. He took the coward's way out and he gave up and he quit. And in, in so doing, he sealed his fate. 
You know, Jesus the same way. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Well, when we read about Gethsemane, we don't see a lot of joy there, do we? We see agony. But who for the joy set before him? He counted it. He considered it. He led or commanded his thoughts to see the outcome of the trial that he was in to accomplish what it was that needed to be done. We talked about Asaph as well. Any questions or comments there on those first uh, 11 verses before we move on? Yes, sir. On verse 8, in regards to the double mind of the man, we have a parallel that Jesus speaks of in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse, starting verse 24, where he says, You cannot serve two masters. Or you will either love the one or hate the other. I consider that to be a parallel to verse 8 about the double minded man. Yeah, it's an excellent illustration of that very problem, right? Trying to have two things as master in our life, it's not possible. It'd be just like being double minded. Appreciate that. So now in this section, we're going to talk about the source of temptation and blessing. In verse 12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So we see there the statement, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. And he tells us why he's, why he's blessed. And that is because he will receive the crown of life. So not only do we gain benefit from enduring trial now, like we studied up in verse 4. There we gain endurance, and endurance is outcomes that were perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So we gain a benefit now, but there's an ultimate benefit or an ultimate blessing that comes from persevering trial. That's something that we have to look forward to. Just like Paul says, we don't focus on the temporal, we focus on the eternal. We don't focus on the things that are seen, we focus on the things that are not seen. And Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6-8. through 8. I'm being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will not only give to me, but to all those who love His appearing. That's the ultimate benefit. That's the ultimate blessing of trial. We'll receive the crown of life. Not the crown of this life, but the crown of eternal life. The life that is to come. The crown of this life is perishing. And there's a lot of people seeking it. Fame and glory and riches and making a name for themselves. Enjoying pleasure. That's the crown of this life. But the crown of life that's being spoken of here is something far better than that. It's what Paul talks about being that eternal weight of glory. The ultimate blessing makes any and all suffering of trial worth it. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Can't even be compared. Again, I think about his sufferings. I think about Paul's tribulations, his sufferings, his trials that he he catalogs for us there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Those things are heavy. Those things are extreme, I would say. To be stoned, and the people who are stoning you think, they're de think you're dead, and they walk off and they leave you there. Just imagine. I can't. But he says, the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. And then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, where he talks about that eternal weight of glory. But there's two qualifiers to this promise. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. He'll receive the crown of life. But he says, once he has been approved. And the idea there is once he's 
pass the test, right? It's what a trial is. It's to put to the proof. It's to test. And so once he has been approved, once he has passed the test, Psalms 11 verse 5 says that the Lord tests the wicked and the righteous. In Genesis chapter 22, we're familiar there with the testing of Abraham. Verse 1 tells us that God tested Abraham. And he said to Abraham, verse 2, Take your, now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains, which I'll tell you. Verse 3, I've always found interesting. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning. I think if I'd been Abraham, you'd probably had to drug me out of the bed by my toenails, kicking and screaming the whole way. But he didn't. He rose early in the morning. It's interesting. Verse 4 tells us that it's not, he's not doing this in the backyard. He's not doing this a mile down the road. On the third day, he's traveling to the land of Moriah. It takes him three days of probably not very uh, comfortable travel to fulfill God's command here. To kill, to sacrifice his son. What were you going to say, Tim? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of times we misquote that and we say, we think revealed to us. But in God's plan, if we are victors over our challenges, it will be to God's glory. We're part of his plan that we would choose voluntarily serve him. You know, he could have made us robots, but he gives us this free will and his plan is that we would love him enough and sacrifice our will for his will and it's it's revealed in us to his glory, to his praise, to his praise. So uh, I think that's important to realize. You know, we're going to see glorious things but we're going to be part, uh, we're partakers, we're instruments in the glory that will ultimately be God's if we're successful. Okay, thank you. So back in Genesis chapter 22 here, we see he's now on his third day of this journey. He sees the mountain, or he sees a a distance, uh, the place where he's to do this. And so down in verse 9, It says, then they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar, and he arranged the wood, and he bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. He's done everything at this point. Except, in verse 10, he stretches out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11, it says, an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Verse 12 says, he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Test. A test of Abraham. A test that Abraham passes. He's done everything the Lord's told him to do. He's ready to take the final step. And we read over in James chapter 2, in verse 22, or... uh, Yeah, it says, you see, excuse me, verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham passed the test. So that's one of the qualifiers of this receiving the crown of life. We have to persevere under trial and we have to be approved. We have to pass the test. Paul talks a little bit about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And in verse 24, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run in such a way, not as without aim, I box in such a way, not as beating the air, 
but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. There's the idea of passing the test. Here he compares it to running a race or boxing, like the Olympic Games is kind of the illusion that we have here. Everyone runs, but we have to run in such a way that we may win. We have to do it in such a way as we compete according to the rules. If we don't compete according to the rules, according to God's commands, then Paul says we are disqualified. We don't pass the test. We don't get approved. And so that's one of the two qualifiers. The other one was as to those who love him. Remember what Jesus said three times there in John 14? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In order to receive the crown of life, we have to love God. What does it mean to love God? That's not just an abstract thing. That's not a t-shirt. That's not a bumper sticker. That's not a crucifix on our neck. That is to do his will, to follow his commands, to keep them. So once we are approved, once we pass the test, when we persevere trial, he says we will receive the crown of life. Any questions, any comments on that? make a comment and if anybody cares to respond to it, I'd like to hear it. Uh, you know, we're told throughout the New Testament that we're to cast all our cares upon Him and He cares for us. And we, we know that Abraham trusted in God. But I can't help but think that during the three days of journey, that they made to the mountain. The anxiety, the anxiety that had not, could not have been going through Abraham's heart. He trusted in God, but did he still not have anxiety? Uh, of course, the Bible does not tell us that. Maybe I don't need to be concerned about that as far as that goes. What do you think? I don't see how he could. I mean, uh, People are wired different sometimes. You know, uh, you look at men that grew up maybe during the World War II era. Uh, you know, those men tend not to be very emotional. They don't show their emotions. They don't cry. Uh, but do they still feel emotion? I'm sure they do. Uh, Abraham trusted God. We read, I think, in Hebrews 11 that he, part, probably part of what he was telling himself was that God would be able to raise him from the dead. I think that's what Hebrews 11 said. So I think what Abraham excelled in is what James talks about here in verse 2, to consider it all joy. So he was taking lead of his, he was taking command of his thoughts, and he was saying, I'm doing this because the Lord told me to, and the Lord has a plan, and I trust the Lord, and I know it'll be okay. So was he anxious? I don't see how he couldn't have been. Was he sad? I don't see how he couldn't have been. Couldn't have not been, that is. So, but that's my thoughts. Trusted him, and that trust that the Tom said has led him to obey. And just another, on that point, love and obedience go hand in hand. But I think when we talk about conditions of salvation, we don't ever think love. You have to love God to be saved. That's what this passage tells us. And that love for God drives us to obey Him. You trust Him, you love Him, you therefore obey Him. Right. It's very much like a child with a parent. You gotta gotta love your parents to obey them. And as a child, maybe you don't do that, but as you get older, you, you develop that love and, and, and you see the, the value that it has in your life. And it's not, John talks about, you know, the idea of, of fear. You know, sometimes when we're children, we, we obey out of fear for punishment, but we get to the point, or John says, we've got to get to the point where we obey out of love. Love casteth out fear. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. So I want to talk here briefly before we run out of time about trial versus temptation. If you've been reading the King James Version, you, you realize that each time that we've, that we've passed this word, uh, it's been uh, translated as temptation. It's the Greek word uh, parosmos or parazo. 
And it means putting to proof or to test. That's what the word means, the Greek word. So the English word trial, <clears throat> first definition of it is, you know, that which is done by a judge or a jury. That's not the kind of trial we're talking about here. Second definition is the act of trying, testing, or putting to the proof. That's the exact definition that we see of the Greek word. Tempt <clears throat> in the English means to entice or allure to do something often regarded as unwise, wrong, or immoral. When we think about temptation, that's what we're thinking about, that which entices us, that which is allures us. And the fifth definition of that word in the English is obsolete. Some dictionaries say archaic, meaning that it's no longer in use. We don't use the word temptation this way anymore. But that definition is to try or to test. And so that's what the King James uses. That's why you see the word temptation there in verse 2 and in verse 12. But the idea there is to test, to put to the proof. But what we're going to see, the context of verse 13 through 15, makes it clear that the meaning of perazo in this specific case is temptation, as opposed to just general testing or general trials. It's talking about temptation. The first uh, idea we get of that's in verse 13. God cannot be tempted by evil. Why not? It doesn't appeal to him. It's the polar opposite of what he is. And then verse 14, it really carries home this idea. Each one is tempted when he is, and here's just about the definition of temptation, carried away and enticed by his own lust. So what are we talking about? We're not talking about general trial. We're talking here about temptation specifically. When lust has conceived, the idea of longing, of craving, of desire. So what are we talking about here? We're talking here about temptation. So if you're reading out of the English Standard, you're reading out of the New American Standard, if you're reading out of the New King James, to, I think it translates verse 12 as uh, temptation, but verse 2 is trial. But anyway, that's the difference. That's why you see the difference in those words in the different translations. We don't use the word temptation in the sense of general testing anymore. We use it in the sp specific uh, case of to be allured or to enticed. And so that's why the modern English translations translate it the way they do. We're probably going to run out of time before we get into this one, so I'm going to stop there at verse 13. Are there any comments or any questions that you have?